Leonardo, again, it is an honor and a privilege to have you with us to to guide us on the sometimes confusing world of taxation in Portugal. So a lot has been going on with the NHR to provide context because there's still a lot of people coming in to Portugal for the first time and they're hearing about NHR and they're not too sure about what it is. Could you provide a bit of history as to where this NHR originated and what was the intent of this piece of legislation? Of course. So the uh, NHR was approved in 2009. It was a very hard time from, from an economic and financial standpoint. We had a subprime crisis. So the purpose of this regime, but we, we got it very uh, heavily here with, with a lot of issues uh, with with the budget, and ultimately we had to call the IMF. Mm -hmm. It was a serious crisis back back in Portugal. So what, mm -hmm. what happened was the regime was approved in 2009, and the purpose was to attract uh, investment to Portugal, but also to attract uh, people that had specific skills and essentially uh, allow Portugal to become more competitive in an international setting. So it was approved... Um, within the context of other benefits that wanted to attract high net worth individuals and people with specific uh, you know, higher education, specific skill sets that could help the country. Mm -hmm. so, so 2009, it was approved. It took us a while to get the momentum, but, um, and, but after one or two years, the things start uh, snowballing. And the regime worked very well in the beginning for pension pension income. So a lot of retirees moving to Portugal. And in case of retire out of pension from past private employment, there was no taxation in Portugal and there was no taxation at source um, mm -hmm. also. So it was a double non-taxation. It was very nice. Mm -hmm. So in the first stage, uh, first, let's say, um, part of the, the, of the uh, program, we got a lot of retirees from all over a lot of people moving from france uh, from other european countries and moving to south portugal is a very nice country to live a warm uh, welcoming so it was uh, and it was still within europe for for most so it was it was uh, it was easier to to, to accomplish uh, the, the relocation i mean then uh, but the, the regime also worked very well in respect of passive income because essentially, aside from pension income, what, what the, the regime had sort of a bifold solution. We had for income flowing from outside of the country, we uh, would apply the tax exemption essentially as a method for to relieve double taxation. Um, but because of the way the tax treaties work and the OECD model works, in some cases, there is a reduced withholding at source. That is the case of interest and dividends or royalties in uh, most of the tax treaties and that would allow a small withholding tax that people try uh, tend to consider um, acceptable so 10 15 percent in some cases five percent in some cases even zero percent and no additional taxation would arise in portugal to those sorts of income so it was easy people would still keep their uh, corporate structures outside uh, most of these, these people would have their businesses for their whole lives or half of their lives. So they were not just relocating the entire corporate structure. They would be relocating them personally, retiring, uh, changing their lives, working remotely, and they would still get this passive income with a very nice overall tax burden, um, mm -hmm. uh, all things considered. So it, 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 it was very interesting. So it was one piece of, of one leg of the regime. The other leg was for employment and self-employment income of derived from activities of high value added, uh, in the cases where those were not exempt, could apply a flat tax of 20%. Now, if you compare it uh, with other, some countries, the 20% is not too good, but you know, um, European countries, I would say even the United States, a 20% flat tax on employment and self-employment income, it, was, it is very interesting. So it was uh, this. This was a the tax, re tax regime was very. I, I think it took me about two minutes to explain it. So it was easy to explain. 
there was mm-hmm. obviously nuances things mm-hmm. we had to plan but it was easy to explain easy to apply and after a few years the tax the tax authorities adapted the formalities and, and the way to apply and it was very easy so you, you would essentially just change your tax residency to portugal it's mandatory mm-hmm. it was it's not an artificial regime you had to change your tax residency mm-hmm. but then after that you could apply it was very easy there was very little room for the tax authorities to refuse the, the request and typically we had a final decision on one or two business days it was uh, easy to do within that context uh obviously the statistics are not completely updated and uh, by the end of 2023 for instance there were a lot of people moving but i think overall there were around 74,000 uh newcomers to portugal benefiting from the regime mm. i think i used the actually the the word in the I was not very accurate not newcomers because in, in fact the regime applied to foreigners moving to portugal but also to portuguese that spent some time sure. abroad yeah. and were returning home mm-hmm. uh, th- that was also an interesting point of the regime because you know we are hearing a lot of complaints from from companies saying it is not or, and from young people finishing their uh, bachelor degrees and master's degrees saying it's not uh, interesting to st- stay in portugal because of the tax uh, mm-hmm. of the tax framework and because of the work conditions and everything so a lot of people uh, immigrating from to outside of portugal so there was a chance to come back with a very interesting regime so this worked well until uh october 2023 what happened in october 2023 our prime minister that's uh, uh, uh but sir what? before we get there you know uh, as, as i know it's hard to you know come to a conclusion one way or the other but is there a point of view as to whether the initiative as it was originally constructed was a success or not was it successful yeah if you're asking for my personal opinion i would say 100 percent yes okay uh but i i have to say that uh, that different opinions are voiced uh in in the media for instance so I hear a lot that the regime had huge costs, but you know, for instance, the estimates and the, and the news point to uh, in, in in English it's a uh, billion a billion I think euros mm. uh, per year of tax costs. Okay, um, but that's because of the way tax costs are computed in the budgets. You know, mm-hmm. the way we we have to do it is by comparing. A uh, regular standard taxpayer residing in Portugal to an NHR, and obviously that has a cost. Yeah. So th- this this is the argument of a lot of people that say that the regime uh, is not valid anymore. It served its purpose, but it's we don't ha- we should not continue. Other argument is that it creates a uh, severe discrimination between people moving to Portugal and standard residents, if you want, like myself. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, it's true. It's, there is a discrimination in the sense that I will pay more taxes than people that move to Portugal. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, what I see is that a significant uh, a percentage of the people that move to Portugal and benefit from the NHR would not move if it wasn't for the regime. So mm-hmm. I cannot I cannot draw an immediate conclusion because of the tax cost that. The, there is an, effic- an effective cost resulting from this regime because most people would not come. And aside from that, the people that uh, benefited from the NHR were people that were not leaving o- out of uh, state subsidies. They right. had their own means of, of subs- subsistence. They bought houses, they leased houses, they acquired services, they went to restaurants. So it created a lot of uh, good dynamics in the economy. So I would say it was successful. And mm-hmm. I would, I would prefer if it would continue. Sure. Uh, but but I, I have to say that it's not unanimous. Uh, I, one reason I think it's not unanimous, or um, at least there is such a polarization in the opinions, is that we don't have accurate economic studies on the effects of yeah. NHR. Mm-hmm. So when I, when I'm um, following the uh, American elections, I have to say. 
uh, I'm a bit jealous because what I see is, uh, I mean, there's pools for everything. Yeah. You know, specific age segments, specific places, activities. And th that gives uh, everyone interesting information on, on the voters, on the impact of decisions. We don't have that study uh, regarding the impact mm -hmm. of an HR. So I would rather have a more like scientific or at least um, an opinion based on, on more economic evidence. But I would say it was successful, yes. And in terms of data, uh, one percentage that I did hear bandied about in the media was 40%. They said 40% of those who had the NHR after the 10-year period, now it started in 2009, right? So people are coming to the end. So roughly 40% of people are staying on and the rest are leaving. Uh, is that a credible number? Is that something that you've heard as well? I heard I heard the opposite. So fifty nine percent stayed in Portugal and okay. forty percent left. Okay, well, which is even better, right? Yeah. Uh, I think we have to. Mm -hmm. I have to. We have to interpret the numbers because yeah, the uh, the ten years are ending for the first people that arrived, mm -hmm. and at that point, most of that people were uh, retirees. So I understand mm -hmm. that uh, if a, someone retires to Portugal builds a house and organizes their life at that point uh, i think there will be a huge percentage of people still s staying here they don't want to I mean, I mean i hardly ever want to leave my house mm. so, so by the time I, i'm 70 or 80 i don't want to yeah. relocate twice so yeah. i understand that those numbers from the first people that applied are still interesting so 60 percent stayed in portugal mm -hmm. uh, what i also what I also uh, get from my clients is that after they, they after the program ends, there is still uh, an adapt an adapting period because then they will apply for the regular tax returns and they will get the tax assessment. Mm -hmm. And there's a shock because the, the, <laughs> the standard system is uh, we have very high taxes. Yeah. So there's a shock. Maybe they will still endure that shock for one or two years, but mm -hmm. that does not mean that they will not leave uh, after a while right but um, from my perception and again it would be very interesting to have more accurate statistics is that after a while a lot of a lot of these people that moved to portugal were not retirees anymore mm -hmm. even because after a while uh, sweden pushed for the refugate for the determination of the tax treaty there mm -hmm. was a change in taxation so retirees started to pay 10 percent so there was some changes in, in the way to tax pension income. So a lot of people moving to Portugal, let's say my sample, I don't want to, you know, I, I cannot say if my sample is accurate because it's mine, but, but I, I think in a second phase, a lot of people moving were deriving passive income. They were still working, yeah. most of them, they were still involved in their business and they were deriving passive income. Mm -hmm. And those uh, people are more mobile. I think mm -hmm. it's easier for them to just switch, change countries uh, easily. Some of them are working, you know, in IT. It's very easy just to pick up the computer and, and mm -hmm. leave. Yeah. Uh, some of them just cap their houses in another country and it's their second, third, fourth uh, relocation in a short period of time. And there is a mindset, especially amongst the young, the younger generations, that, I mean, even if they are resident here, they will just spend two months here, three months there, one year abroad. So it's, I think the numbers in the future will say that uh, if the program ends, there will be less people staying here mm -hmm. than before. And, and this, if you want to allow me to just uh, one final remark, when you asked me about the success of the program, it, it is very interesting to reflect on this, and I think this reflection should have been done before terminating the program as it was, mm -hmm. because if the purpose of the program was to attract specific uh, individuals, specific uh, uh, professions, activities to Portugal, I don't know if it was successful. I don't think a lot of... I'm pretty sure that universities took advantage of it, for instance, but I don't think that there was... A significant flow of people to Portugal to uh, 
you know, from the high value added activities because of the of that uh, the tax regime. So yep. if the purpose was that, I'm not completely convinced. Mm -hmm. But what I also hear is that companies that want to incorporate, for instance, in Europe, yep. they can use Portugal if they have a tax regime that is that allows them to attract talent. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it was used. A lot of American companies incorporated here and yep. were able to bring their own engineers and their own people mm -hmm. because of the NHR. Yep. But there is another side of the regime that was, I believe, very successful. And I mean, um, I lived the uh, subprime crisis. Uh, it, it was awful. Uh, there was no business. So yep. lawyers always find things to do, but it's better to work when the economy has momentum. There are operations, there's mergers and acquisitions, there are mm -hmm. contracts, everything is flowing. Yeah. Um, and, and after that, it, it, everything was on a standstill, was awful. And with this regime and with a boost in tourism, suddenly the country became more and more trendy and yeah. everything started to move. So, so I think the, the overall economy um, got better because of programs such as the NHR, Mm -hmm. And also the golden visa, yeah. So, it, but yeah. this is uh, my take. Again, I would like to have more, uh, more, more uh, statistics on that. Feature, but my yeah. take is that people mm -hmm. move. I, I go to restaurants in Lisbon; they're full. They're full of foreigners. It's yeah. very nice to have people from other countries moving to Portugal. It's a, like mm -hmm. the melt. It, the melting pot is very mm -hmm. interesting. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I'm, I'm probably being biased on this, but I, uh, I thought the uh, regime was very su successful and interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so fast forward to October 2023. Yeah. Uh, things kind of blew up in the sense that dramatic changes were initiated. So uh, to the extent that we have uh, clarity, can you give us a, like a, a summary of what makes this new NHR distinct and different from the previous regime? Yeah, I, I, I would say I would say that we have we should have three different situations to bear in mind, I would say. Mm -hmm. First, we are still looking at the old regime in some cases. All right? Why is that? Because first, the regime allowed the, the uh, state budget that terminated the NHR allowed the grandfather, the grandfathering clause. So people that has have the regime will still have it until the end of the ten year period. So the regime is still in force for those. Mm -hmm. um, two, there is a transitional period. So even it is possible still today until the end of the year to relocate to Portugal and apply for the NHR in certain conditions. Mm -hmm. Which conditions are that? Essentially, there was a huge complaint that was, we shouldn't end the regime. I think we've discussed this in the last time I was here. Uh, yeah. the, you, we, shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't terminate a regime that, what, that is in force for over a decade uh, from one, yeah. one day to the other. There are people that already made plans to move. They're mm -hmm. in good faith. They're selling their houses. They enroll their kids to school. So mm -hmm. the transitional period, to some extent, was protecting those people. And, to, and so, if steps were taken before the state budget was presented to Parliament, that was on December 10, uh, in some cases, you're still allowed to apply this year or to change residency this year and apply until March next year. Mm -hmm. If you had already a lease agreement before October 10, if you bought a house before October 10, if you started your immigration process before that date, uh, if you enroll your kids to school before October 10, so there are still uh, a few cases that that can apply. I mean, in my mind, if you want like a, a, a common denominator to them all, is that people that were already in the process of moving to Portugal may, in a, in a significant amount of uh, situations, still be able to apply, and they, they will apply, and they will benefit from the old NHR. So this is. Mm -hmm. The second, the second case, we are still looking at the old one, and then there is the new one. And regarding the new one, what we have is a narrower 
scope of application in terms of eligible individuals, but we have a broader scope of benefits. Mm. Why is that? I mean, there is the the regime was not a is not even called NHR. It's a it's a, a and it's a tax incentive to research and development. It was it is not it's no longer core of the regime. It's no longer uh, in the personal income tax. It's the, the tax benefits code, and so it was construed as an incentive to research and development. Mm. And it will apply to a number of cases, for instance, um, professors, um, people that have jobs in uh, research and development. Mm-hmm. All of these, there, these, these cases of research and development will apply. They are very, um, how would say, specific. If we have one person that actually fits and I don't think they will move to Portugal because of that, but that will allow their hiring to, to, to be smoother and most efficient. But right. I don't think that this on its own will attract many people to Portugal. It can attra- attract the right people, but it will not be massified as the, the previous regime. But the regime also uh, allows, at least in two cases, uh, uh, a relocation of individuals with that, that can be applied to a bigger number of people. So not just the professor, the university professor or the scientist. Two cases are the following. People that move to our autonomic regions of Madeira and Azores, they can also benefit from the regime as long as they qualify uh, as a high-value added, acti- added activity. The list of high-value added activities will still be published. We still don't know exactly what will be the list. But I would say that in a significant amount of cases, it's my, my point, people will still be able to relocate. I have to say, Madeira and Azores are amazing places to be. Mm-hmm. It's not Lisbon. They're very, very nice places to be. And I would say that a lot of people may be interested in moving there. And the regime... So my guess is that the list will be fast. It will not be very narrow. So I would say that this regime will, in fact, be applicable to a significant uh, number of people. But then there is another way to do it, which is um, th- there is a possibility to benefit from the regime if you qualify, and the regime change slightly the uh, requirements, say, uh, highly qualified professions. Instead of high-value added, it says... Yeah. High, uh, highly qualified professions, uh, as long as you work, you have that profession and work for a company, which is in the list of activities that that, mm. that will still be approved by the government. Until it is approved, you will still apply the old list of high-value-added activities. Mm. And amongst the companies that are eligible, there is something like um, administrative um uh, assistance. So if you have a company which which purpose is to assist from an administrative point, render support to another company, that company is still eligible. Mm-hmm. Right? So mm-hmm. you, you, you'll have like um, ha- housing, hotels, restaurants, uh, consulting, IT, all of those are eligible. But then you have one last uh, activity, which is Activities and administrative uh, support services. Mm-hmm. So, in in when I read the uh, the provision, at least until there is a change in the high on the highly qualified activities mm-hmm. on the list of eligible companies, mm-hmm. my th- my you know, I th- I think the regime will still work with some uh, planning because. You have to work for a company, and the company has to be in the list, and the company has to export fifty percent of its services. But mm-hmm. actually, Darren, actually, what we see in our clients is when they move to Portugal, they still want to have a corporate presence here. Yeah, there, mm-hmm. for many reasons, they want to have a corporate. Uh, some of them, they tell me, I want to, I want to contribute to the country. I want to carry out a business here. I'm. I'm mm-hmm. living here. It's fair that I also carry out my activity here. Mm-hmm. So, and a lot of the activities that they do is they're, they're rendering support remotely to their own corporate structure that they left behind. Mm-hmm. So, in, in my mind, mm-hmm. you, you, this has to be substantial, obviously. 
But if you incorporate a company that will also render support services to other countries outside of, of, of Portugal, that the, mm -hmm. your actual corporate structure, obviously invoicing at our, an arm's length, I mean, no funny business. This is an actual business. Yeah. But mm -hmm. it's an, an actual business that is uh, that that matches the needs of many of the people that actually move here. So mm -hmm. you would still benefit from the NHR. So it's not just clicking the button as it was before, because not everyone incorporate, not everyone will still be on business. So it mm -hmm. will not be for for all. But the good news are, if you're eligible, the benefits are aside from the flats tax of uh, 20 percent you'll be exempt from income from foreign sources and remember in the beginning where i said the regime worked well with dividends and interest because mm -hmm. they had a small withholding yeah. but obviously we are always looking at the overall tax burden mm -hmm. and the way tax treaties work is that sometimes you have taxation at source so let's say you had an apartment mm -hmm. or let's say um you sell your apartment, you have a capital gain. Mm -hmm. That capital gain will be taxable at source. So even if there's no taxation in Portugal, you already suffered a significant amount of taxes at source. Yeah. The advantage of this new regime is it exempts in a broader range of situations. So mm -hmm. um, okay. where, while, while before... We can explore this one, but while before the tax exemption would apply only in cases where the income was taxable at source, mm -hmm. now the new regime does not make that difference. So there is an exemption mm -hmm. provided the income flows from outside of Portugal and it's not from a tax haven. So it's okay. it, 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 in a nutshell, if you want, I think it will work better, for instance, with capital gains from the sale, uh, from the sale of securities mm. where, where there's... Uh, uh, resi residence country has sole taxing powers. There's no taxation at source, and mm -hmm. provided it's not a land bridge company, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there will be no taxation in Portugal, as we are reading the, uh, the provision as it's it was approved now. Okay, so it, it is quite interesting potentially. So in terms of it being a shift from uh, focus on high value added activities to you know this whole narrative around research and development so let's let's kind of take a a closer look at that so that we understand it and we appreciate it more fully so when you say like people lecturing in higher education involved in scientific research so are you uh, or does the legislation really want to strengthen the university system or if someone has a great idea and they want to engage in R&D within their organizational framework, they can incorporate in Portugal, they can move to Portugal and engage in R&D activities. What is the definition of R&D? Is it private, public, or both? Yeah, it's both. It's both, yeah. I'm very glad you asked the question because we are our mindset from before was that uh, the the NHR was a regime for everyone. Yeah. It was, it had to be an, uh, assessed on a case by case basis, mm -hmm. but in the benefit could be bigger or smaller, but in essence, everyone could have some sort of a benefit. Mm -hmm. In this new regime, I think there is still a leg of the regime that can apply to some of the people that were looking for the regime prior to its cancellation mm -hmm. under the structure that I was just explaining. Mm. But the other leg is there. The regime, the new regime, really wants to attract new companies to Portugal, new researchers, and mm. new investments. So you're asking: Is it public? Is it private? Well, it's both. Uh, there is there is scientific research that is, is, is rendered to entities which are integrated in the national system of uh, of science and technology. Mm -hmm. So that they are either public or at least are, they are in cooperation with with, uh, with the state. But there are also there is also the possibility of having private entities that will do significant investments in Portugal over three million, and the company in itself will have a tax benefit. Uh, and as long as the investment is is deemed relevant under the tax code, uh, the and the tax codes. Um, you will still 
be able on a personal level also to benefit from the regime. So it's the companies in itself already had the benefits and have it for a, a number of years. But there is the other side of the coin, which is we need to attract people that are able to this business forward. And this is what this new regime does. So in it, this will, this is directed at significant investments, actual business activities with, that are interesting from a research and development uh, standpoint that are looking to Portugal as a place to, to invest. Okay. And I answer? Yeah, yeah, I, I, you did. Thank you very much. So just pushing forward a bit. The it mentions chapter two of the Portugal of the Portuguese investment uh, Portuguese investment tax code, and yeah. it speaks about skilled positions within that context. So, are you excluding by definition people who may be relatively unskilled? Some data entry. I'm answering the phone. Probably not. And so what is the definition? How does one define the skill position within that context? Like you need to have a university degree. How is it defined? Yeah, I, I have to tell you, I it's hmm. not completely clear to me okay. uh, exactly who is going to benefit in terms of, of the individuals uh, working for it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm still hesitant to provide an answer. I'm still not completely sure right, on yeah. how it will work from, from that standpoint. Mm. My feeling is, yeah. is uh, obviously the, the thing is we were we are going to have elections uh, in March. Yeah. Uh, th there are still some portions of this regime that still need further regulation. Some mm -hmm. parts of it, even in the absence of further regulation, will work with the prior ordinances that apply to the NHR. Mm -hmm. But there's still uh, there are still some practicalities to be to to be uh, dealt with. My feeling is, if it is typically these these sort of investments that we are uh, speaking about are contractual benefits that yeah. that you you will need some sort of uh, of state involvement. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, right. There, so there will be clarity on that. Okay. So again, excluding the uh, the the I, I guess the. The regions like Madeira and the Azores, which have uh, a great degree of autonomy, you're yeah. looking at two levels of approvals. One f for a company would need to be approved to benefit from this regime. And then the second perhaps would be positions within that company. It's not everyone from top to bottom in this organization yeah. is going to benefit. It'll be no. positions within. So the government will need two level of approvals, whereas previously it was just one, right? It was just the individual, highly skilled or not, right? Is that a fair way of summarizing it? Um. Yeah, it's well. It's it's a fair. Uh, it's I think it's a fair assessment. A it's it's a fair assessment. Basically, w when we are looking at these new regimes, there's uh, always a a, pro a a period of um, of transition where things are still being fine tuned. Mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, the NHR took a long time to be approved. So I remember filing yeah. by hand petitions, and it, they took one year and a half. The last ones we filed and were approved from one day to the other. So there's still there's still things to be fine tuned. On the side of the companies, these regimes are working well for a number of years. W working well, I don't, I don't know if they are attracting in as much investment as they could, but at least they're, they're, be, they're, I mean, functioning and, and uh, the procedures. I think are very well uh, fine tuned, and, and and that that side, the side of the company, is already in motion. Mm -hmm. In this case, in the case of the uh, of the individuals, I think. It will be clear shortly that mm -hmm. the regime will apply to which the regime will apply, and I think the procedures will ultimately be very also automatic as it were, as they were before. This mm -hmm. in, at this moment we have mm -hmm. good news and bad news. The good yeah. news are we can immediately apply the regime for people that want to incorporate a company and they want to export from that company services yeah. because mm -hmm. we are still using. The uh, prior ordinances. In mm -hmm. some other cases, we are still look, 
we're still waiting for for the legislation that may take a few months i i guess but because we have the experience from the other regime i think it will work well and i believe that we will have clarity by the end of the year everything will be clear so i don't think there will be any significant roadblocks in applying the regime mm -hmm. uh, and and these sort of investments do take some time and some planning so there will be uh, i think clarity mm -hmm. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. And moving on, so the rules, at least it's translated into English, the, it mentions certified startups and, and it defines it, you know, talks about staff yeah. of no more than 250 individuals, annual income not exceeding 50 million euros. Is this separate from research and development or is this startups within the R&D space? There is a specific notion of startup uh, okay. according to the law. So this is a different thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, the uh, research and development is another indent from the regime. So it right. applies to, to, to other other entities. And mm -hmm. the issue with the, with the notion of startup is that uh, mm -hmm. it, it has uh, less than 10 years of, uh, of uh, actual exercise, less than 25 uh, workers, mm -hmm. under 50 millions. But there are other other requirements. But there has to be a, a round of investment, um, right. at least one round of investment by uh, a venture capital or another entity. So it's right. it's not the, the the this will apply for sure. This this will be very interesting for actual startups. See, mm -hmm. this is a very substantial regime. This will be a very interesting benefit for startups that mm -hmm. will be able to hire people to work in, in the startups. Mm -hmm. But this is not a regime that will apply for people that want to move to Portugal and will simply be able to incorporate a startup. It won't work. See, mm -hmm. if you have a startup, if you have a project, uh, and if you qualify, obviously, most successful startups will have a round of investment. So if you are yeah. a real startup, please come knocking, please come to Portugal. We have a tax regime for startups. We have mm -hmm. a tax regime for uh, stock options on startups. And we'll have this incentive, incentive to hire people to work on the startups. Mm -hmm. so, so, so see what I, uh, what I was uh, meaning before? I think the regime has still has one solution for more massified cases of people that move to Portugal and will still be able to carry out their business remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, they will have a presence here. They will be working. They will be integrated in their corporate structure, international corporate structure. Mm -hmm. And this applies, I would say, to uh, a significant amount of uh, activities. And it doesn't even have to be startups. See, it's mm -hmm. more massified. But then we have that specific... But, but within that one, does that type of activity need to somehow be related to R&D? Or on the more massified? Yeah. Not necessarily, because Not necessarily. Yeah. Uh -huh. one of the, at least uh, according to the current ordinance that we are applying, at least until new legislation is passed, mm -hmm. we have one of the cases which is you can have a car a company incorporated for administrative support to other companies. Mm -hmm. This okay. is real. This is they are rendering uh, support mm -hmm. uh, on uh, administrative uh, issues. They're mm -hmm. they're rendering support to other entities in the group. Mm -hmm. So I would say it is realistic that uh, if you are in a at least big or medium-sized group that you have one entity which is rendering services, support services to the others. So mm -hmm. it's realistic that you have that and it doesn't have to be connected, linked to research and development. Mm. Okay. So, and this is separate from the startups as defined with a minimum yeah. of 25 employees and have gone through a round of funding. So, okay. So yeah. like, like there are three categories of companies, right? They are, let's say those in R and D, those are that in the startup phase, but you know, not, they're not brand new. They, they have some track record. They've had a yes. round of funding because they at least have 25 employees, so something is going on. So that's the second group. And then there's like everybody else, which is the situation that applies right now. You, you can come, you can you can incorporate a company, perhaps that's related to uh, an enterprise that you've been working with previously. So, yep. but the benefits that will be available would be different for each of these. Benefits will be the same. It's 20% flat uh -huh. sacks for, yeah. for the individual. Mm -hmm. And then exemption in Portugal uh, in respect of foreign income. 
So the, the benefits will be the same. Right, but okay, so at the individual level, but at the corporate level. Oh, okay, it's different, yes. The benef okay, right. Okay, so the, and, this. And at the corporate level, the, the benefits are already, were already approved. Right. The concern right. now is more to have, it's a, I mean, it's a social concern. We mm -hmm. don't, uh, it's, it's a concern to keep people in Portugal, it's a concern to bring mm -hmm. talent. Uh, I want to bring all, you know, engineers from tech companies that are working uh, in the US. If you're carrying out a new, expanding your business to Europe, mm -hmm. come to Portugal, we'll have a regime that will allow you to, to uh, maximize the income in the pockets of your employees. You will be able to attract talent. Mm -hmm. So it, it's good. So I think you, you summed it up very well. So three blocks, research and development, startups, and as a solution to other cases mm -hmm. that are still substantial and you're still carrying out business. Then there is a transitional period that will still apply the old NHR, mm -hmm. uh, provided that you are already sort of in a transition period. So you started your visa application. It, it was taking a, lot, a long time, so you were unable to change tax residency. Mm -hmm. You signed the lease, but you haven't uh, mm -hmm. signed the deed. You actually found a house. You you booked, uh, uh, you know, made, made a reservation to make the uh, promissory agreement. A lot of practicalities to sometimes to relocate to another country. Uh, in those cases, or at least in most cases, you'll be able to still uh, apply for the NHR. Right. And then there is there is a concern that we are having. I guess this concern will be common to you working with several jurisdictions that have this uh, in these programs. Obviously, this NHR program, the NHR 2.0 and the old mm -hmm. NHR, they have, uh, they have their time limits. So mm -hmm. it's 10 years. After 10 years, what else? Am I staying in Portugal? Yeah. Yes, do it, of yeah. course. Uh, some other people are looking for additional tax regimes. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, they're looking into Spain, they're looking into Greece, they're looking into Italy. But I wanted to bring a new jurisdiction to the table, which, okay. which is Cape Verde. Oh, okay. It's a new one, right? All right. So because we were, we were obviously at the, at my, the firm, you know, my firm has offices in a significant amount of jurisdictions in Africa. Mm -hmm. And we were looking at uh, solutions and tax regimes. And we, I mean, what we have to say is that Cape Verde has an NHR program, which is very, very similar to the Portuguese as it mm -hmm. was before. So mm -hmm. flat tax, mm -hmm. interesting. The flat tax is 10% instead of 20% for high value activities. Yeah. You will still have the... Uh, or the tax exemption from income fro flowing from outside of Cape Verde. Mm -hmm. uh, we have basically the same rules that apply in Portugal. So it's basically the Portuguese NHR mm -hmm. that will still apply in Cape Verde. Mm -hmm. Residency criteria also similar to Portuguese, 183 days or existence of an abode mm -hmm. by the end of the year. And the uh, visas, I'm not, I'm not by all means uh, an immigration lawyer, but the and the equivalent to the golden visa that we had here is actually very competitive because it just requires an uh, 120,000 euros investment. Mm -hmm. 120,000 is very low. Mm -hmm. Also, the fees there were, there were fees that had to be paid to our immigration services to renew. Mm -hmm. They're negligible, but like 100 euros instead of mm -hmm. thousands of euros that were paid in Portugal. Yeah. So we are looking at that jurisdiction as a possible solution, also because uh, Cape Verde is a very nice place to be. Yeah, yeah. It's warm, yeah. it's uh, welcoming. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's really not, uh, it, it's really a very interesting uh, jurisdiction also to consider, mm -hmm. uh, at least for some for some people. That yeah. Maybe more mobile, etc. No, that's a good point for some people that may be interesting so you mentioned the golden visa type equivalent is there like an equivalent of like what portugal has is d2 d7 as well that variant or is it golden visa or nothing i no. We, i think you have i'm not an immigration lawyer so i, I don't want to jump okay. over the fence but but you i think you have a regular visa 
and you have the golden visa. I uh, just brought up mm. the golden visa because what, mm. from what I've been reading, it's very easy to, to get. Mm. Investment is minimal. Mm -hmm. Let's say you have 120K is nothing for these sort of investments. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there are accommodations there that you can also lease or, mm -hmm. or, or at least uh, uh, service departments or, or places yeah. that if mm -hmm. you're not there for one or two months, you can also use to, uh, to derive some income. Mm -hmm. So it seems very reasonable. And, and it's golden visa, it, the investments in real estate, we can... Currently, we don't have the golden visa for real estate, but mm -hmm. there you, you, will have, you will have it. So right. we're not buying land. Okay. It's nice. Yeah. Quite interesting. Uh, I'm switching it back to Portugal, though. The yeah. autonomous regions of uh, Madeira, the Azores, after the 10 year period has elapsed, would it be possible, or is it like a potential scenario where the individual may move from mainland Portugal to one of these autonomous regions and continue to enjoy certain benefits, perhaps not at the same level, but still something to make it interesting? Have you seen that? I didn't get it. Uh, the the Madeira and the source have the, their, they have some autonomy, and yeah. one of their auth autonomic powers relates to the, they have some leeway to reduce the tax rates, and they do right. it. Yeah. So, for instance, the standard corporate income tax rate in in uh, Madeira is fourteen point seven percent, a little bit below fifteen percent. Whereas mm -hmm. in the mainland is twenty one. So, mm -hmm. so the standard regime in the islands is already more welcoming than in, in yeah. the mainland. And now they will have the uh, the NHR for people mm -hmm. that reside there. What does it mean to reside there? They have to stay, is, there's a presence of 183 days, mm -hmm. uh, almost if, as if they were uh, an independent country. And mm -hmm. if you're no, no, if it is not possible to demonstrate the 183 days, you'll be looking at the center of vital interest and see if it is yep. there or not. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you don't have to stay for the entire year. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a quick flight to the mainland, and it's a very nice place to be. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know if I don't know if yeah. so what I, what I was thinking is just just in that scenario where someone has come to the end of the 10 year period on the Portugal mainland okay. uh, I just thought it would be interesting for them if it is that they are sensitive to the the tax side of things and perhaps you know it's an added benefit to enjoy you know a different side of Portugal the beauty or whatever it would be an interesting move to move to one of those islands, uh, well, you know, to, to gain benefits. No, mm -hmm. no. If you if you if you benefited in the for if you benefited from the NHR, you yeah. cannot just move to the islands and benefit from this 2.0. It's not possible. There's, right. there's, there's not a lot okay. of it. You may not benefit from NHR 2.0, but on the corporate side, you'd benefit from the lower corporate rates that already Absolutely. exist normally, and. Absolutely. At the individual, even when you look at the the regular tax tables for the autonomous region, they tend uh -huh. they they may be more attractive than the mainland. Yeah, yeah, it's possible yeah. They, they they can reduce can reduce it. I'm telling, saying this by heart, but they can reduce it up to th uh, thirty percent. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it won't be as attractive as the twenty percent that they'll walk. Away, that you know had just expired, but it would be still more interesting than remaining yeah. on the mainland. So potentially, yeah, it, yeah. yeah, it is possible. Yeah, it is possible. Mm -hmm. So you, you probably heard of the, our free, the better free trade zone regime. Yeah, that allowed for five percent of the corporate income tax, provided some investments were made. Mm -hmm. uh, this is five percent. It requires investments there. It required uh, a structure there, etc. But it compares now with the standard regime of 15%. This is mm -hmm. the standard. The, there are no additional uh, investments, no additional mm -hmm. compliance. So mm -hmm. I, I think your, your question is very, mm. uh, you, you, it's a very good observation. The standard regime in the islands is, uh, is very interesting on its own. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, okay, so just moving, you know, stepping back now and looking at the way things are evolving. So just to, just to confirm, foreign and in, uh, foreign investment income, uh, well, in terms of interest and dividends under NHR 2.0, 
would still be excluded interest and dividends but in terms of capital gains or securities income is that still a question mark or is there greater certainty now it's the the, it's what the law says is foreign income will be exempt and then they list the category the boxes of income that are eligible and capital gains are on it so according to the provision as it's as it reads now capital gains taxable or not taxable outside they will be exempt here so so it's so that's a good news story it's going to get better yeah. there's certainty now there's no confusion it's certain okay good the the, the reg- and the regime is easier to apply that's what, what what i was saying there is yeah. there are more difficulties in making sure that you are eligible for the regime but mm-hmm. if you are eligible for the regime i would say that the benefits are even greater now than it did, than they were before because mm-hmm. there, i mean there's no requirements to be taxable and the range of uh, income that will be uh, exempt in portugal will, will be bigger right that's that's nice yeah and, and and just to confirm foreign real estate income so rental or your solar property and this capital gains that continues to be excluded exactly. under 2.0 yeah right yes okay now and to go in position just just to add something uh yeah. because we ha- we had a uh, Obviously, we had some concerns about housing over the last years. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was the argument to change the features of the. Uh, can can you? Re- there's a, a reflex here. The sun. Can you see me well? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. Mm-hmm. Th- there was there was some concerns, and uh, there were some changes in the tax rates applicable to re- to rental income. Mm-hmm. So obviously, you you can bundle it up and apply progressive tax rates. But you were able to apply also a special ta- flat tax rate of twenty percent before it was twenty eight percent. Now mm-hmm. for housing leases, it's, it's it starts at twenty five percent. But then, if you have longer term leases, the tax rate will be slightly reduced. So if you have a lease over five years, you have mm-hmm. a fifteen percent tax rate, for instance. So if mm-hmm. you have a lease for you, you you'll just make a regular lease for over five years your tax rate is 15%. If it is from foreign income, Mm -hmm. you may get uh, an exemption under the NHR or or under the NHR 2.0. But even if it is domestic, uh, in a domestic investment, and you have a a rental income flowing from inside of Portugal, which is, which was, was, and still is Mm -hmm. not under the the NHR, you will still have a a very nice, uh, let's say, palatable, nice tax effective tax rate of 15 percent yeah i mean it's definitely lower than the ordinary tax table so that yeah in itself is very attractive and th- there is no trick to it it's uh, you just yeah. have to make a list of five uh, of, of, over five years which is mm-hmm. i would say pretty common if you're actually leasing for someone to live okay and foreign pensions is it yeah. is it still a bit nuanced in terms of working for the public sector versus private sector and whether it's a lump sum and, and so on? No, it's, uh, it, mm. it is uh, exempt. If it comes from foreign yeah. sources, it's exempt. So even, okay, all right, so let's, let's be clear. So if someone has a pension that was accrued due to working with the private sector in the U.S. and they moved to Portugal under 2.0, that uh-huh. pension is ten percent. Ten percent, yes. So sorry, I was I was telling you exempt. I was uh, it's ten percent, yes. Right. Okay. It's ten percent because under the original NHR, private yeah. sector could have been taxed. Yeah. Uh, well, the thing, yeah. The thing is, uh, well, let's let's go by step by step. In, okay. Under uh, initially, the what the regime says it was it, it was uh, mm. pension income was exempt if it was not derived from Portugal or for work rendered in Portugal, so it was not right. sourced in Portugal, mm-hmm. um, it was exempt. Yeah. Thing is, when you look at tax treaties, there, there are two ways to allocate the taxing powers in pension. If it is a pension from past private employments, there, is, there are exclusive taxing powers at residence. Mm-hmm. Residence was Portugal and Portugal was not taxing. That was leading to a double known taxation. If it was from public service, then mm-hmm. Because the source country would tax, Portugal would still exempt, but there would be a first level of taxation. So the benefit was not as great as it was in, in pension from past private employment. Mm-hmm, this mm-hmm. is how it was. Then it, it, it switched 
to 10 percent yes okay yeah uh, again we still have the same issue if the source country will tax that even if there is a credit in portugal there will be a first level of taxation at source so yeah. it, it still works better with an effective tax rate of 10 percent if it is from private employment mm -hmm. the issues that we we mention is uh, it's not easy to understand if they're coming from the pri uh, private sector of public or public sector. Right. And under, under Portuguese law, there are different rules that will, for instance, if, if it is a lump sum or not, that will qualify as pension income or, uh, or uh, for instance, as investment income. Mm -hmm. If you have, uh, if you, in some cases, when you have a lump sum, uh, but, but it's your standard pension, you can still qualify it as a pension. But if it is not, if it if it is like from an investment product and you get a lump sum, it will qualify as an investment pro, uh, as an investment income vis-a-vis uh, -vis qualifying as a pension if it is paid on a periodic uh, periodically. So the mm -hmm. qualification of pension income in Portugal, you know, broadly speaking, will depend on who is paying. If it is a pension scheme, private or public, if it is paid one shot or not. Mm -hmm. And also, if there were, uh, if it was taxed as employment income at uh, at, at the outset, for instance, mm -hmm. you have like a matching grant. Yeah, you, you your employer just pays for a for a pension scheme. Mm -hmm. Is that may be effectively taxed at that moment as employment income if you yeah. have an acquired right, meaning that yeah. if you leave the company, you still have the right to that yeah. pension. Yeah. In other cases, it's not. Uh, tax taxable because you don't have that acquired right. If you mm -hmm. leave the company, you will lose that. Mm -hmm. And the taxation then will depend a little bit on on that as well. So the taxation of pensions is very nuanced. Uh, or, or from that standpoint, it will still be because the rules uh, haven't changed. But if it is pension income, uh, the, the rule hasn't changed. It's the, so so it's not it's not exempt. Mm -hmm. so the rules haven't changed. In the perspective, right. So it's still going to be ten percent. But uh, before there was a risk of it being taxed as securities income under certain circumstances. But that has yeah. been removed since the legislation in two point is clear on securities income. Correct. Mm, no. I, I, what What was the issue that I I, I didn't get? It. Under there, 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 are dif there are difficulties in interpreting the law and applying because of the facts. Yes. Yeah. I think that those those issues will still subside under 2.0. Okay, so we'll continue. Okay, all right, gotcha. Gotcha, okay. Uh, foreign social security, is it still the same again? Right. It's, it's going to be similarly nuanced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This this is the fine... Uh, the, these are the wordings, the, the, the small, the, yeah. you know, wording in, in the bottom that no one reads. Um, now you made me think about the pension income, so I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the drawing board and, okay. and study it again because mm -hmm. I'm not seeing significant changes, but uh, I'll have to go back and study it again. So don't take my word for granted on that. I'll have to go back and study. Regarding the pension, the, the social security, mm -hmm. the this is a, a huge issue because mm -hmm. whenever we are applying the NHR, uh, the NHR is a, is a 2.0 or or the original is a regime that was thought up for personal income tax mm -hmm. and social security is a whole different shebang. It's a different tax, different tax code, and there were no benefits uh, from the NHR on mm -hmm. on social security. So, if you're a contractor, you'll have 12 months of exemption, and afterwards you'll pay 20 percent of social security. Mm -hmm. If you're an employee. You pay thirty four point seventy five percent overall. The burden should be split between the employee and the employer. Yeah. But uh, I mean, if it's your own company or if you have a big stake in the company, it's left pocket, right pocket. So it's a huge burden that yeah. did change. That remains, and that is a reason why the NHR was still much more efficient in respect of passive income than yeah. it was regarding uh, regarding. Uh, Employment and self-employment income. Yeah. What about on the other side of the of the table? So instead of uh, we we clear on contributions, but what about on receiving social security? If you're retired and you're receiving social security from your your country of origin, 
Any no. difference in how it's treated under 2.0? It's pensioning now. It's pension. And so the nuance would still apply. Yeah, it's still apply. Okay. All right. But if it, if it is from uh, if it is from 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 social security, it will uh, it will qualify as pension. Even if it is paid on a lump sum, if it is from social mm -hmm. security uh, mm -hmm. or your standard so, uh, standard uh, social security regime, if it if, if we need, and obviously what happened is uh, the Portuguese tax code was thought out um, thinking about the uh, Portuguese system. The Portuguese system yeah. has an institute, the public institute of social security. Mm -hmm. Everyone does their own deductions and pays there. And yeah. there is one social security regime. And then you can have your private so social security. This was the you know what was in the minds of the legs of the lawmakers. Mm -hmm. When we look at other countries, the systems are slightly different. So you have your public system that will be sort of as our social security, and that is pension income if it is paid regularly, uh, periodically, or yes. on a lump sum. Yeah. But, uh, but there are other ways to do it. For instance, Switzerland, mm -hmm. I, I don't think there is a public system. There are private systems that are mandatory, so they should qualify it as an equivalent to our social security because it's, mm -hmm. um, they're mandatory, yeah. but the entities that manage those, uh, those contributions are private, and there, are more, there, there is more than one. I would say that that would still qualify as pension income. Mm -hmm. My opinion mm. on that. And, okay. and when we look at the United States, obviously, uh, then, then you talk to me with numbers and letters, and it's very difficult yeah. to understand sometimes yeah. uh, how to how to frame that uh, that that payments under our Portuguese system. And it, is it pri private? Is is it public? Is it mandatory? Mm. Is it a firefighter that's uh, Makes yeah. discounts and receives something. Well, it, I think it should be the standard, the public system, yeah. mm -hmm. even if it is paid by a public, a private entity. Correct. Uh, well, yeah. yeah. All right. Gotcha. Okay. And in terms of transparent and well, potentially transparent or opaque entities like US LLCs and S corps, any difference in how those are treated or the the same nuance would apply in those cases. Um, I have no news on that. Uh, I mean, I, the uh, still the news that I have. Uh, maybe the, the news that I have is that there there are. Uh, I mean, there are your rules, U.S. rules that will be set to companies such as LLCs transparent. They will be yep. transparent under U.S. law. Yes, but Portu Portugal will not just take your qualification on the transparency. Um, <clears throat> for its face value or simply follow the rules of the U.S., they will look uh, at the company and apply Portuguese rules, Portuguese transparency rules. So in order for an LLC to be transparent under Portuguese law, the LLC has to be transparent under our own rules. Uh, mm -hmm. And our rules on transparency say that if you have a professional uh, activity carried out through a company, say you have a law firm, or if, if you're an architect and everyone within the mm -hmm. firm, I'm simplifying <laughs> it, but if uh, everyone within the firm carries out architectural uh, works, then it will be transparent. Or if you have a company that is used simply to manage assets, such mm -hmm. as real estate, mm -hmm. that company is transparent. But as you can see, it's not automatic, and it's not every LLC that will be treated as uh, as transparent. Then there is the issue of the qualification of the income that flows from US mm -hmm. because it does not necessarily qualify as a dividend, for instance, yeah. for the purposes of the tax treaty. Mm -hmm. It will most likely qualify as other income. Mm -hmm. uh, but because the, the tax treaty also have some specific provisions under the NHR, the, the previous regime, it, will, it would still be taxable in the US and it will be uh, exempt here. But in Portugal, uh, the income, from, from income flowing from the LLC will still be the investment income. Even if not the, a dividend or profit per se, it will still, in my opinion, qualify as uh, investment income. Right. And as investment income previously, 28%. 28%. With yeah. this new regime, still 28%, 2.0? If it, it no, it's if if it applies, uh, if you apply it, it will zero percent. It is exempt so, as long as foreign source. Yeah. So that's a really good news story, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Potentially, depending yeah. on the circumstances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but okay. uh, 
but but I mean, uh, the, there was the, the news were very bad. The mm -hmm. regime will end, and if you read the the the, the regime, it's mm -hmm. uh, they're very there are a, lot of, uh, a number of remissions to uh, I don't think remission is the right word. It refers to other pieces of legislation, yeah. making it very hard to read. Yeah. And the bulk of it, in fact, is for companies that will carry out significant investments in Portugal that will, mm -hmm. will do research and development in Portugal. Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, will not be as useful to as set, such an amount, uh, a huge amount of people that, than it was before. But mm -hmm. the, when you continue to read, you say, well, but there, there is mm -hmm. a lot of people that will still fit the requirements of the regime. And for those yeah. people, yeah, the regime will, will be good. Okay. And, well, with C-Corps, then that, that remains relatively straightforward because they are not transparent and the returns are generally considered to be dividends if in the hands of shareholders. Of course, we need to look out still for issues around permanent establishment and, and, and someone creating nexus by, by working in Portugal at a yeah. certain level and office space and so on. Of course, permanent establishment and also dual residency issues. That's, yes. that's uh, something that we need to account for, obviously. Okay. But, uh, I mean, uh, the, regarding the P issue, we can, we can, I mean, brainstorm a little bit. Mm -hmm. What, okay. what I was saying about permanent establishments is that mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think we should bear in mind the following. Yeah. Uh, the presence in Portugal was a re uh, required by the foreign company or not. One. Mm -hmm. Is it your own company where you hold 100% of the capital or not? Yeah. If it is a foreign company and you're an employee, you're a manager, mm -hmm. you're a shareholder, but it's not 100% held, mm -hmm. and you're moving to Portugal for personal reasons, I would say that under the current OECD model commentary and international doctrine, you have very good arguments to say that there is no P because the presence in Portugal is not business related, is but right. it's taken by personal uh, reasons. Exactly. There's international tax doctrine pointing out in that in that uh, direction. Mm -hmm. And if it is, what if, what if it is uh, your own company? Then it gets more tricky because there is a uh, confusion between the company and yourself mm -hmm. so the OECD model commentary are much more uh say clear on, yeah. on the risk of a permanent establishment here in in that case obviously mm -hmm. you need to uh you we need to make sure that your business in portugal is simply intermittent and is not carried out on a continuous basis so mm -hmm. the risk exists Mm -hmm. But we do have to tackle it on a case by case. Uh, uh, it has to be a, a case by case analysis. Case by case, okay. And, and perhaps similarly, uh, another topic that is uh, interesting is crypto. Oh. <laughs> Any changes in the way crypto is taxed, or is the previous regime still going to stand? Yeah, previous regime. I have okay. I have troubles reading the regime because I'm not uh, you know very t I'm very technologically handicapped. <laughs> so, but in a nutshell, what I can understand if you is if you have a professional activity, it's considered a business activity. Yep. Uh, mining and etc. Et uh, and the the advantages of the regime in Portugal are, for instance, if you are selling the crypto assets because it's considered a capital gain. So you, it's yeah. not your activity. You're doing it and it's, it qualifies as a capital gain. Uh, and and if you keep the assets for more than 365, uh, the, for 100, if you keep it for more than one year, yeah. uh, it, it will become, it is not taxed. So mm -hmm. for, from what I've been hearing from clients, if you're not doing it professionally, there is a, a lot of people that simply hold the assets for uh, for over one year, and you will get this possibility of, of your income not being taxed. So I think it's um, I think it's a beneficial regime. I would say it's interesting at least. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, penultimate, almost there. The question around so-called blacklisted jurisdictions and non-cooperative jurisdictions. Yeah. Portugal has a particularly long list, over 
Over a hundred, I believe. So basically, any island with good weather <laughs> in the world <laughs> is on, on that list. Yeah. So again, no changes in how those are treated. Uh, the there will be some, let's say, tax. It's not taxed in a favorable way. So you won't get any tax-free dividends. You're not going to get tax-free interest. It's going to be taxed, and it may be taxed punitively. Plus, you may have issues with banking as well because Portugal banks are aware of, of those lists. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's a very fair summary. So long lists is a list that is has not been updated for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you can have an aggravated tax rate of 35%, for instance, if you get dividends or interest from, from those uh, jurisdictions. You also apply CFC legislation, meaning mm-hmm. if you keep your company in the BVI and you're driving income that is not under the carve out, mm-hmm. you want to do some, you know, in a nutshell, it is not passive income. Mm-hmm. Uh, Plus, active income may be outside of the CFC rules, but if it's possible, mm-hmm. you will apply. And you yeah. automatically tax it in Portugal at an aggravated tax rate with with no uh, NHR, <coughs> uh, even if you don't distribute it. So, mm-hmm. punitive, uh, you said that, what was your word? Punitive yeah. taxation, yeah. anticipated yeah. taxation, because you don't even have to distribute and a, a very long list. The only yeah. thing I would point out in that respect is that there are countries which are listed uh, with which we have tax treaties. Okay. And that worked with the uh, NHR before. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, my, in my opinion, as long as you have a tax treaty, mm-hmm. there is at least a possibility to exclude the CFCs if you keep distributing the income. So mm-hmm. it's in a way strange because they're still blacklisted, but you have tax treaties. And right. there is a possibility under the law that the <clears throat> countries would just file to take out their, to, to, to be enlisted mm-hmm. as possible if there is exchange of information. But uh, the law is in our tax codes for a long time and I haven't seen it. Um, I haven't seen great changes in the list. Okay, understood. Uh, Sometimes think- people get a bit... Uh, mm-hmm. uh, it, it's strange for when I speak with in some jurisdictions when I say well it's blacklisted tax mm-hmm. purposes of, no 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 this jurisdiction is not blacklisted we are fully compliant I say oh yeah, yeah. And we are talking about two different things yeah. this is a list that was prepared only for tax purposes a very long list uh, and the consequences are mainly from a tax standpoint mm-hmm. mm, yeah yeah it, it, yeah it, it is quite um, interesting. I don't think, I mean, of all the jurisdictions that I'm exposed to, I believe that Portugal has w- the longest list. Yeah, yeah. possible. Possibly, but, yeah. Yeah, possibly. Mm-hmm. So the last the last question that I have is around the treatment of foreign trusts. Okay. Uh, generally speaking, um, that treatment, tax treatment, would remain unchanged in the sense that whatever the distribution would be from whatever the foreign trust, assuming it's not from a one of those non-cooperative or blacklisted jurisdictions, of course, which will be a separate thing. It would be, it'll be just taxed. Uh, there's no tax benefit per se from using a trust structure, generally speaking. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the tr- we, we don't acknowledge the, the, the exactly. figure of a trust. It doesn't exist, yeah. Doesn't exist here, so it's treated under law as a fiduciary structure, mm-hmm. uh, and under the personal income tax code. So, if you have income flowing, uh, can be treated as a, a capital gain. If it is, if, if there is a, a dismantling of the trust, for instance, mm-hmm. and you were the settler of the trust, mm-hmm. if you were mm-hmm. not a settler of the trust and you're getting income, it can be considered investment income. And in some cases, there is a stamp duty um, exemption, but that stamp duty exemption will apply also if you're inheriting money from from your parents. So it's not mm-hmm. just so. So the fact that you have a trust from a mm-hmm. tax standpoint, in from a Portuguese standpoint, is not 
particularly efficient. Mm -hmm. Plus, I tend to see trusts being set up in low tax jurisdictions, which are blacklisted, and that complicates things a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Leonardo, wonderful. Thank you once again for. Uh, uh, now, I, I want to just <laughs> to correct something. I just, I just tweak a peek regarding yeah. the pension income. The provision okay. that, that said 10% was actually revoked. So I will apply oh, nice. the standard okay. regime. I was just tweaking a peek on, on that. Uh -huh. It was revoked to 10% for, for, uh, the NH, for the 10% the for the NHR. Obviously, the, uh, the ones that already have the regime will still, will still have it. Mm -hmm. But for, for the new one, it will not be 10%. And the news there, I mean, i rather discuss that in another program because they're awful. <laughs> Banking income tax at regular rates is awful. Right. Okay. So, of course, this would, like you were saying earlier, be nuanced in the sense of is it public? Is it private? Is it lump sum? Yeah. But there's now a chance, whereas previously maybe not, there's now a chance that it will just be taxed under the normal tax table. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Whereas before we have, we had an interest in qualifying as pension income because there was 10% and even before it was 0%. Mm. Uh, now maybe you have an, an interest in qualifying it as an investment income because in some cases you will just take out of the tax base 20% or even more depending on uh, uh, the, the time frame of that investment. Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. we have ta a tax benefit for investment, for certain investment. If you just withdraw the funds after eight years or if you withdraw it after five years, you will take out a significant portion of the tax base. Uh, so maybe now you will have an, uh, an interest in qualifying as investment, whereas before the uh, interest was in qualifying it as, as a pension. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Sorry well, for that. Uh, <laughs> of, of course, uh, you know, that that's, that is, that is indeed a, a challenge vis-a-vis -vis the previous regime, but that underlines the need for good advisors like yourself to make sure that the, the person coming into to Portugal does proper planning and is not shocked by the result, right? So. No, that's always, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. see, we have been speaking for over an hour now yeah. mm -hmm. at, at, you know, in a nutshell, we have mm -hmm. the previous regime still in force. Mm -hmm. We have a regime in force still with a grandfather clause that exempted the pension income for mm -hmm. you know, people that that applied before the change of law. Yeah. We have the transitional period. Mm -hmm. We have we have the NHR 2.0. Mm -hmm. Within the NHR 2.0, there are at least three blocks of cases, all of them with different requirements. Yeah. So. We try yeah. to simplify things, but obviously, uh, you always need to look at the situation carefully mm -hmm. and in advance. Mm -hmm. Some structuring may be necessary, mm -hmm. uh, but for sure, the most important is just to look at the facts. Yeah. And uh, let's hope we have uh, ch favorable changes in the near future. Yeah. When, when would we expect it? Uh, I guess post-election, so towards yeah. the end of the year, yes. maybe? Yes. Mm -hmm. The elections will be in March, so it will take some time for the new government to take office, And mm -hmm. uh, but, but more closer to the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Maybe there will be some changes, maybe not. Uh, typically, when there is a new government, it's uh, quite likely that the, a new budget is also approved at least uh, for a certain period. I would expect that the budget for, for 2025 will have significant changes because one way or the other there'll be a new government with new ideas mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but uh in respect of these regimes i would say closer to the end of the year there'll be clarity but but still we can apply the rules as they are now at least for a portion of them